Okay, um, if you remember, I, I ended last night by looking at eliminativism and epiphenomenalism um, on the grounds that if physicalism can't be shown to be true, and I'm not saying we've shown it to be false, but I am saying there are big questions about its truth. So we looked at epiphenomenalism, the idea that perhaps mental states aren't causally efficacious at all, because the problems for dualism and physicalism were that um, mental states can't be shown on either by the look of it to be causally efficacious. Epiphenomenalism just says, well, let's accept it. They're, they aren't they aren't causally efficacious, they're epiphenomenal. Um, and eliminativism says, well, if they're not causally efficacious, then why do we bother with them at all? Let's get rid of them. Let's just say there aren't any mental states. Um, I hope I left you in a perplexed state um, last night, because if dualism isn't true, physicalism isn't true, epiphenomenalism is hard to take, and eliminativism is even more hard to take, then... then where are we? Where, what are we going? So let's start today. Um, so the 20th century um, in the philosophy of mind was largely devoted to the attempt to demonstrate that mental states are identical in some sense, whether type, type or token, token, identical to physical states. Um, none of these was an unqualified success and some would say it wasn't a success of any kind. Um, so... Uh, in the final quarter of the 20th century, one philosopher, um, Hilary Putnam, Hilaire actually, Hilary is a man, um, came up with a possible explanation for these repeated failures. He put forward a thought experiment that seemed to show that there could be a principled reason for our failures. Now that would be nice actually, because if you failed every way you've looked, if you could find something that would show why you failed on all these things, that, that would actually be a, quite a satisfactory um, response to all your failures. Um, what he asked was, could it be that we're looking for the mind in the wrong place? We've been looking for the mind here, inside the head, and thinking that if it's inside the head, surely it must be the brain. Surely mental states must be neural states. Maybe, says Putnam, it simply isn't the case that the mind is inside the head. Eh? Um, to understand Putnam's thought experiment, we've first got to understand internalism. Okay, we've been assuming internalism <coughs> up to now. Um, internalism is the view that mental states are states of the sort that are inside us. Okay, states that are in here, located, literally, spatially located inside the head. Um, so the mind and all its mental states are intrinsic properties of a person. Okay, what do I mean by intrinsic properties? Two different types of properties. There are um, properties that I would have, even if the rest of you were to completely disappear, if there was a cosmic accident that led to everything going out of existence except me, I would still have those properties. So probably being female is one such property. If, if nobody else was here, nothing else in the world, but just me, I, I would still be female. I'd probably also still be five foot six. Um, various other properties I would still have that would be intrinsic properties of mine. But as you lot are here, I, I think, um, I have lots of relational properties as well. So, for example, I'm six foot in front of John. Um, I'm also uh, the sister of Judy. I'm also the um, owner of Oedipus, or it might have got yeah, that the wrong way around. Um, <laughs> but do you see I have relational properties as well as intrinsic properties? Are you with me? Okay. So um, the internalist thinks that the mind and all its mental states are intrinsic properties, or at least determined by intrinsic properties. So if the environment were to be completely other than, than it actually is, I would still have all the mental states that I actually have, because my mental states are not relational properties of mine, instead they're intrinsic properties of mine. 
Um, so Descartes, for example, was an internalist. He believed that all our beliefs about the external world could be false. Um, he argued for this by arguing that all our beliefs would be the same, even if the world was entirely other than we take it to be. So let's, let's do the Cartesian thought experiment just quickly. Um, he went down three levels of doubt. What he was interested in is, could we find certainty? Are, are any of our beliefs such that they're certain? Um, and he thought, well, how am I going to find out? And what he said was, I'll find out. What I'll do is I'll, I'll look at all my beliefs, and if I can find even the slightest case for, for the slightest doubt, I'll put them on one side as if they're false. You know, he, he's got reason to think they're true, but he's also got reason to think they're false. He'll treat them as if they're false uh, until he's left, I hope, he thought, with something that's absolutely certain. And using this method, he went down three levels of doubt. So he said to himself, well, OK, um, my senses have sometimes deceived me. Something that I be believe to be black in a shop turns out to be blue. You realise that I'm paraphrasing Descartes. This is not his own. Um, it turns out to be blue. Uh, or one of Descartes' own examples, I think the stick is straight, but I put it in water and I see it's bent. Um, well, well, if your senses have deceived you, does that mean you should put all your senses in the doubting basket? Um, so should you treat all your sensory beliefs as if they're false? Because in the past, you, you've had reason to doubt them. What do you think? N OK, lots of people are saying yes. Anyone say no? Well, that assumes that you you believe something just because of one thing, like you believe the stick is straight. When you put it in the water, you have different additional information, which may, it looks as though it's bent, but you know that's because of refraction. So well, you, we know that. Um, yes, uh, but you're absolutely right. The fact is, what Descartes said was, well, actually, that all that does is cast doubt on those sensory beliefs that I form in conditions of suboptimal, uh, well, uh, under suboptimal conditions. So um, the only way I know that my sensory beliefs have deceived me is because I've trusted my sensory beliefs. So I see the six straight, I put it in water, it looks bent, and I think, hello. OK, I've now got reason to think the stick is straight and I've got reason to think the stick is bent. Um, something's got wrong here because they, it can't be both. So what do I do? I test it with my other sense. OK, I, I use my sense of touch to see that actually, even when the stick looks straight, sorry, looks bent underwater, it still feels straight. So I've got more evidence for believing it's straight, and that's why we come up with a theory of refraction. Why should this happen? Because light bends um, when reflected off an off object in water. Is that a reasonable account of refraction? Um, OK, so, so we've, we've still got only very few beliefs in the doubting basket at the moment. And the next level that Descartes went to is the level of dreaming. OK, you all think that you're in a lecture theatre, uh, with a philosopher in front of you lecturing. Um, do you think it's possible that you could wake up in a second and find yourself still in bed? No. <laughs> you don't agree with each other. <laughs> OK, um, those of you who said no, why not? Well, you said no and you said no. It's not the sort of dream I have. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you have that tonight. I bet, bet you have that dream tonight. <laughs> I won't ask you what sort of dreams you do have. Um, but because I have input from other people, which I wouldn't have in my dreams. Oh, wouldn't you? No, uh, not, not in the... I mean, they would, all my dream would be into one, towards one thing. It wouldn't... Have you never had a lucid dream? A dream when it really seemed to you as if you were awake? And then you're completely amazed to wake up? I never had an argument in my dream. So have I. OK, well, may we treat you as unusual for the purposes of this experiment? Um, I, and I bet you will have an argument in your sleep tonight. <laughs> um, we can only distinguish there are such things as dreams 
because we actually have a lot of evidence of the difference between dream and non-dreaming, and it's a bit like the stick OK, case. I, I hadn't got that far, but, but Frank's given the answer. What I was going to go on to ask is, OK, um, given the phenomenon of lucid dreams, the fact that sometimes when we're asleep and dreaming, we believe that we're awake, I put to you that it could be uh, with you at the moment that you believe you're awake, but you might wake up in a, mi in a minute and find that you were dreaming it all. In which case, it's not, as you believe it is, true that there's a philosopher in front of you. It is with you as if there's a philosopher in front of you. So it's true of you that you believe there's a philosopher in front of you, but there isn't a philosopher in front of you. Well, <laughs> I don't know what you have in your bedroom, but um, <laughs> there's only one philosopher in my bedroom. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, right, where are we? <laughs> okay, so the fact is you can have all the reasons you think you have for believing that the beliefs you have are true, and yet they might still be false. So the dreaming argument puts on one side all the beliefs, uh, puts on one side as if they're false, that is, all the beliefs that would be false if um, you were dreaming. Now, that still leaves you with beliefs like 2 plus 2 equals 4, which is true whether you dream it or whether you're awake. Um, so any belief that would still be true whether you were awake or asleep isn't yet in the doubting basket. Are you with me? OK, so now we go to the third level of doubt, which is the level of the evil demon. Um, now, that'll get the hackles up of people who don't believe in evil, evil demons. Um, but actually, the evil demon is, is unnecessary, because what Descartes is asking you to consider here is two of your absolutely fundamental beliefs. You believe that um, your perceptions are caused by something outside yourself, okay? And you believe that your perceptions are a good guide to whatever it is that's causing them, okay? Those are two beliefs you have. Now, the trouble is, you can't get outside your perceptions to see what is causing them, can you? Um, and it, it, if you remember, we looked at whether A causes B. Um, you have to be here, don't you, to see that A you have evidence for the belief that A causes B because you have to see a correlation between the two. And if that's a perception and that's the cause of your perception, you can never be in that position. You always in that position. You're, the world that you perceive is actually cut off, you might think, by your perception of it. It could be with you exactly as you believe it to be, okay, so all your beliefs are exactly as you take them to be, and yet the world is completely other. And Descartes said, so the belief that your perceptions have external causes, you have no reason to believe that because you can't get outside your perceptions to see whether your beliefs have external causes, and also that your perceptions are a good guide to the nature of the causes, well, how do you know that? You don't even know your beliefs have causes. So what Descartes is actually thinking is there might be nothing outside. All the, the only thing that could exist, as far as you know, um, is that your mind exists and that you believe it is with you as if things are thus and so. You don't know that they are thus and so. Um, and so Descartes thinks that that's an impossible thought experiment. He thinks we simply cannot imagine that there's nothing outside, that there is only our own mind. And so what he does is he puts in an evil demon. We would maybe put in an evil scientist or something like that. I, I don't think that is, is as good as the evil demon, because the thing about the evil demon is it's supernatural. The demon could be causing you to have all the beliefs you're having, um, without a, um, there being anything of th that makes your beliefs true. Do you see what I mean? So you believe you're sitting in a lecture theatre listening to a philosopher um, with a light shining on her and a PowerPoint presentation which has got some lovely pictures coming up later uh, and so on. You, th you think that but none of it's true because actually there's just your mind. There isn't even your body 
your belief you've got hands. The demon can come in between you and that belief. Do you see you, we've reached hyperbolical doubt? Um, and that's at the point at which Descartes says, OK, here I am. The only thing of which I'm certain is my beliefs about my own beliefs. How interesting, because I thought that it was the world of which I was most certain. It turns out to be my beliefs about the world of which I'm more certain. Um, and at that point, he starts thinking, well, you know, what do I know then? Let's have a look at these beliefs. Let's look more closely at what a belief is and why I... And he decides, actually, there is something of which I'm certain. And does anyone know what it was? Cogito ergo sum. Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I am. Um, there are thoughts, therefore, well, we won't go into whether it's um, inference or performance, but because there's thinking, he thinks, if I think, I must exist, and that's the cogito. Anyway, um, do you see that Descartes, on that ground, must be an internalist? Because if he's assuming that his thoughts would be as they are, even though the world is completely other than we take it to be, in other words, all our beliefs about the external world might be false. Descartes must be thinking that the identity of our beliefs themselves are functions of our intrinsic states, not of our relations to the world. So, so here's a pretty picture. I'm rather proud of this. OK, so um, internalism, this is the world we think we're in. OK, world one in which our thoughts about the external world are mainly true. I mean, we know they're not all true, but they're mainly true. So if we have beliefs about cars and trees, uh, it's because there are cars and trees about which we have beliefs. OK, so the world about which we have beliefs and the beliefs we have about that world are appropriately related. So our beliefs are true. Um, this is world two, which Descartes is, is considering. Um, I couldn't find a demon on PowerPoint, but, uh, but I found an evil scientist. So, um, so world two, we have exactly the same thoughts about the external world. We believe there are cars and trees and lecturers and philosophers and things like that. But as a matter of fact, all there is uh, is an evil scientist who is causing you to have these thoughts. So the cause of your perceptions and thoughts, etc., is entirely other... <laughs> than you take it to be. But notice the identity of your thoughts is a function of, of you. It's got nothing to do with the world. Are you with me? So that, that's an internalist belief. Penny. But what if you discuss your thoughts about the world with somebody else and they have exactly the same? Well, well everybody you talk to believes that there are trees and cars. Well, they do. Yeah. Don't they? So I mean, if you ask Susie whether there are trees and cars, she'll say yes. Well, they do. Yeah. Don't they? I mean, if you ask Susie whether there are trees and cars, she'll probably say yes. Well, let, let's go back. Do you remember yesterday I made a distinction between the world, thoughts and language? So what you're wanting to do is to check your beliefs of the, about the world against um, Susie's beliefs. OK. Now tell me, what makes you think that your beliefs about Susie are not beliefs about the external world? Nothing. They are. And why couldn't the demon come in between your beliefs about Susie in exactly the same way as it would come in between your beliefs about the car? Well, I suppose it could. It would. So you believe that you say to Susie, you believe that Susie's there for a start, and you believe you say to them, Oi, are there any trees? <laughs> <laughs> and you then believe that she says yes. OK, so your beliefs are all nicely consistent and you think, ah, la, lo, there are trees, because Susie says there are. But, <laughs> but you're actually just jumping on the spot, aren't you? You're, you're not going anywhere because it's no good. It's a bit like me checking the Times against the Telegraph. Except, of course, the Times doesn't I'm exist. Sure the the why would there be? Why <laughs> should there be a demon? What's the point? Um, the point is not, the demon is, is actually not the point at all. The demon is only brought in because Descartes can't imagine that there's nothing. Um, the fact is that you have beliefs, which is that your perceptions of beliefs are caused by an external world. 
and that your perceptions are a good guide to the external world, and you have absolutely no justification for that belief. Do you see? But that's what Descartes getting at, because what he's asking is, what is knowledge? And you can't have knowledge unless you have true beliefs. We claim to have knowledge of the external world. Our beliefs about the external world will only count as knowledge if they're true. What justifies us in thinking they're true? Actually, says Descartes, nothing. Um, and yet we, we can't not believe them. I mean, Descartes isn't claiming we don't have these beliefs. We definitely have these beliefs. What, what he's questioning is to what extent they're justified or to what extent they count as knowledge. Uh, I saw another couple of... Patrick and then Chris. Uh, well, I just said, do you mean logically don't justify it? Uh, there's no other sort of justification than logically. Well, it's it's empirical justification, I suppose, but... Um, uh, well, even empirical... Hang on, empirical justification. Why do I believe this table is there? Well, I can see it, I can feel it. Uh, all of that's empirical justification, but actually, my belief that the table is there is justified by the fact that my belief that I can hear it, my belief that I can see it, both logically uh, support my belief that the table's there. The demon can get in between all these beliefs. So empirical beliefs are as much in need of logical justification that is put in question by the demon as any other sort of belief. Uh, the only reason you can ever have for believing a belief is true is that there is another belief that supports it. Beliefs are, are um, a, if you like, a self-contained system. Chris? If you believe in an evil demon, uh, you're at a dead end, in fact, because that explains everything and we might as well go home now. <laughs> well, but it isn't like that, is it? I mean, the evil demon is put in there just as a device to make it easier for us to, to undergo this thought experiment. It's certainly true that if you decide, OK, there is an evil, de evil demon, then we might as well go home. But you've got no more reason for believing there is an evil demon than you have for believing there's an external world. Yeah. And, and so what, what we're doing is, as always, this is what philosophy does, is it takes your belief and it says, well, what's your justification for it? L let's pull it apart a bit and let's see if you are justified in believing it. Um, and the thing is, you've got this lovely little faith, interesting word that, isn't it, uh, in the external world. Um, and actually what Descartes is showing is, is that it is faith, because you have got no good reason for believing it, um, even though we do all believe it. L let's move on. Do you like my pictures? Yes. Yeah. I was really proud of those. Um, OK, so if you remember, we're looking at this because Hilary Putnam uh, wants to argue that maybe beliefs aren't the sort of state that get inside us, that are inside us. Um, so that's internalism, which you were all assuming, weren't you? You were very happy to go along with Descartes' thought experiment. You, you can see why he thinks that, um, why Descartes thinks that it's possible that all our beliefs about the external world are false. Now, Putnam's coming along and he's asking us to question internalism. He's asking us to think about the possibility that beliefs are not states that depend on our intrinsic properties. OK, well, he asks us to imagine our planet Earth, well, that's easy, a person, Oscar, which we can model on Bob Stone just to make life easier, uh, another planet, Twin Earth, uh, and Oscar's doppelganger, Oscar Twin Earth. OK, so Tosca or something. So this is what we're ma imagining. And Twin Earth is exactly like Earth, except that the stuff that runs in rivers that they drink and shower in, etc., has the chemi chemical composition XYZ instead of H2O. Look, the two came out as a su subscript this time. OK, we'll call this water Twin Earth. Um, incidentally, when Putnam did this thought experiment, he obviously didn't take into account that we are mostly water. Um, and just ignore that. It's a complication that, that haunts this experiment, and it's really quite irritating because it's completely irrelevant. Um, but just to say it's not gone unnoticed. We, we, <laughs> um, <laughs> 
it, causing us to... Yes. Um, Oscar um, on Twin Earth is identical to Oscar on our Earth with respect to all his physical properties, his neural properties, etc., his phenomenological properties, so the world seems to twin Oscar exactly as it seems to Oscar, okay, so the phenomenal properties that, that Oscar has are exactly the same phenomenal properties. So if Oscar sees Susie's red waistcoat, it is this morning, um, then twin Oscar also sees twin Susie's waistcoat. Um, has the same experiences and so on. So physical properties are identical, phenomenological properties are identical, and therefore their behavioural dispositions are identical. In other words, what we're saying is that Oscar and twin Oscar are qualitatively identical with respect to their intrinsic properties. Okay, this is the thought experiment. Penny doesn't think this is possible, and we all know that it's not empirically possible, but the question is, is it logically possible? Of course it is. It's not, because, uh, because he can't have the same physical properties, because to have the same physical properties, he'd have to depend on water for life, and water doesn't exist. In the, you know, on H2O for life. Why couldn't he depend on XYZ for life? Because then he wouldn't have the same physical properties. OK, this is why water was a bad but but I hope the rest of you see that this is irrelevant. It really is irrelevant. No, never mind, it is irrelevant. Well, no, you, you, if you think it through for yourself, you will see that it's irrelevant. You, you couldn't... Uh, never mind, L let's move on. OK, ah, oh, more pictures. OK, so this is Twin Earth, and you've got um, Twin Oscar here, whose eyes have gone green, I see. Uh, and you've got a glass of XYZ here, uh, and Twin Oscar is thinking to himself, that's water. Okay, and then down on Earth, you've got Oscar himself, and you've got a glass of H2O, and Oscar is thinking to himself, that's water. Okay, so far, so qualitatively identical. The next thing we have to imagine is that Oscar is overnight transported to Twin Earth, where he finds himself in the same room as his doppelganger, and both of them are looking at a glass of water, the same glass of water, but this is, of course, X, Y, Z, because we're on Twin Earth, it's not H2O, and both of them are thinking of that same glass, that's water. And the question we're going to ask is, are the twins thinking the same thought? So here they are. Uh, we're on Twin Earth, both of us are on Twin Earth, and there's one glass of XYZ looks exactly like water, but, but actually is XYZ, not H2O. And both Oscar and twin Oscar, who haven't noticed each other, or they'd be freaked out, and they wouldn't be thinking that's water, um, are thinking that's water. And the question we want to ask is, are the twins' thoughts the same? Are they thinking the same thought or not? Think about it and put up your hand if you think they are thinking the same thought. In one respect, well, it's the same concept. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the they're, same literally having, they're literally the having, having the same thought. Put, just put your hand up, will you? <laughs> Can I ask I what say yeah. they are? Then? Can you ask what? I'm not saying what thought they have. I'm not saying anything about it. I'm asking for your intuitions. Is the thought that they're having the same or not? OK, most of you think that it is. Uh, the rest of you, do you actually think not, or are you sitting on the fence? Put up your hand if you think they don't have the same thought and you don't know this thought experiment of old. David, put your hand down. Um, John, do you, you think they don't have the same thought? Why not? Because they're thinking about different things. Yeah. OK, you, well, they're both thinking about this, aren't they? Yeah, it's not the same thing. No, they're not. But it is the same thing. They're, it's this exact, they're in the same room, and they're both thinking this of that. So the subject of their thought is exactly the same. It's the same glass of water. Except one of them's wrong and one of them's right. Uh, one, who said that? Who said one of them's wrong and one of them's right? Well done. But you know about this as well. <laughs> right, OK, let, let's move on. Um, if you're an internalist, 
okay, you have to say that the twins are thinking the same thought. So actually, given that most of you are internalists, we've already agreed that, you're at least consistent. Um, if you're an internalist, they have to be thinking the same thought. Because if Oscar and twin Oscar are physically identical, neurophysically, logically identical, they're also um, behaviorally identical and phenomenologically identical, and beliefs supervene on intrinsic properties, as their intrinsic properties are identical, they must be thinking the same thought. So your internalists' intuitions caused you to say they are thinking the same thought. Okay, fine. Um, so as a da 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 da, okay, that's what I've just said. Um, but we might want to insist that the twins' thoughts are different. There should be an S on thought, um, are different. And one reason for thinking this is that Oscar's thought is false. And yet twin Oscar's thought is true. I think that's what you were getting at. It wasn't it, actually. Rather, yeah, OK, that's what you said. And that's what I, I'm pretty sure you were getting at, John. Um, when Oscar is thinking about water, so when he thinks that's water, he's thinking about H2O. But the liquid he's thinking about on twin Earth is not H2O, it's XYZ. So his thought, that's water, is a thought about something that's not, sorry, his thought, that's water, on twin earth, is a thought about something that isn't water and is therefore false. Are you with me? So let, let's go back to this. So um, for Oscar, the, his concept of water is a concept in the extension of which is, H is H2O, not XYZ. For uh, to Oscar, twin Oscar, his concept water is indeed a concept of XYZ. So when he thinks that's water, his thought is true. But when he thinks that's water, his thought is false. That's the thought. I'll come to you in a minute. There are a couple of questions there, but let's just finish the thought experiment and then we can look. Um, so when twin Oscar thinks that's water, he is thinking about twin water, and twin water is X, Y, Z. And when both the twins are on twin Earth, twin Oscar's thought that's water is about thought of something that is twin water, and it's therefore true. So Oscar's thought is false, twin Oscar's thought is true. And if their thoughts were the same thoughts, entertained in the same circumstances, then their thoughts would have to have the same truth value. Why do I say this? Because it's the content of a thought relative to a specific, specific context that determines its truth value. So, for example, the content of the thought, it's a cat, entertained whilst looking at a dog, is going to generate the truth value false, isn't it? Are you with me? So, if we go back here, there's a difference between... Um, truth, the truth conditions of a thought, this is a very important logical point. The truth conditions of a thought um, determine its content, or are its content, if you like. So um, with, t with Oscar, uh, his thought, that's water, is true, the conditions under which it would be true, OK, not is true, but would be true, are we, when H, H, H2O is around. Um, and so the truth conditions plus context determine truth value. So there's a difference between truth condition, which in effect is meaning, and truth value, which is... So the meaning of a sentence in a context determines its truth value. You with me? And that's why we might think that Oscar's thought, um, oops, I've lost it. Here we are. Okay, so the truth conditions of twin Oscar's water concept are X, Y, Z. The truth conditions of Oscar's water concept are H2O. Different truth conditions, we know that because in the same context, they determine a different truth value. I, I see that there are questions. I'll come back. I want to get the, the experiment out and then come back to the questions. Um, 
So the tw if the twins, if the twins' thoughts differ in truth value, it can only be because their contexts differ, and we know that that's not the case in this thought experiment, or because the contents of their thoughts differ. X hypothesi, they're embedded in the same context when they're both on twin Earth, so it must be the contents of their thoughts that differ, and this means they're not thinking the same thoughts. Um, so Putnam argues that as the things, he believes the twins' thoughts do differ in content, but as they're identical with respect to their intrinsic properties, in other words, all their internal properties, their intrinsic properties are the same, this has to mean that thoughts, the, the very content of your thought is a function of, of your relations to the environment, not of what's going on inside your head. Um, so the, the very nature of your thought is determined by the environment, not by things inside your head. Um, internalism, therefore, says Putnam, is false, and externalism is true. OK, let, let's take a few questions before we go on. You, you've had your hand up for ages, going, Bleh. Well, uh, I, you said if the thoughts were the same, the definition of the twin Earth Oscar is that water is X, Y, Z. So I think their thought was the same because they had different definitions. I'm not disagreeing with externalism. Hang on, what do you mean they had different definitions? They did. The definition of Oscar in twin Earth was a different definition. No, both of them uh, have no idea about the molecular content of water. Well, in fact, we could imagine that this takes place before 1759. Okay, I can imagine now. I travel back to the Greece where I am, uh, where my mother lives. I don't uh, understand in the morning. I'm too tired. I open the fridge because I need a glass of water. I pour uh, a glass of water. I drink it. It's not water. It's uso. <laughs> and I have a big soap. And, and it's not, my belief is not true. It is external, the conditions are different. Usually, uh, I... No, you're con I'm sorry, you're confusing truth conditions and truth value. Um, again, look, the um, content... Ooh, it's gone green. Can you read it? Yeah. yeah. The content of a thought, um, which we might think of as a, the con um, conditions under which thought would be true or false. Okay, so to, to grasp a thought is to grasp the conditions under which that thought would be true and the conditions under which it would be false. Do you, do you accept that? So, so if I'm trying to teach a child the concept cat, I'll show it lots of cats, black ones, furry ones, thin ones, etc etc lots of different cats and I say that's a cat that's a cat that's a cat um, and when I think the child's got it I point to a dog and I say is that a cat and the child should go no that's not a pussy cat um, now the, when she says that I know that she's grasped the truth conditions or at least I have evidence that she's grasped the truth conditions because she knows when it's true that the thing I'm pointing to is a cat, and she knows when it's false that the thing I'm pointing to is a cat, so she's grasped the meaning of, of cat. Uh, so the content of a thought is determined by the conditions under which it's true or false. To grasp a thought, to understand a thought, is to grasp the conditions of truth and falsehood. And the content plus context, okay, so if you have the, the content, that's a cat, those truth conditions that we've just talked about, and the context is one in which there's a dog, okay, those two together determine truth value, false. But if the context is one in which there's a cat, they determine the truth value, true. Okay, so when you go to the fridge in the morning, the truth conditions of your thought, that's water, um, are nothing to do with ouzo, are they? I mean, ouzo would generate false. So, so if you have um, those conditions are, unless it tastes like water, it's not water. And so if you have ouzo, whoops, ouzo, how do you spell ouzo? Um, it's false. 
whereas if it had been water, it would be true. Uh, <coughs> thinking of the child recognising the cats, say um, on the 20th occasion you showed... Sorry, can I interrupt you a second? Do you, does anyone mind if I open the door? Because I'm going to faint in a pool of little... <laughs> I'm hot. Sorry, mm. go on. It, it seems to me that it's quite interesting. It's an interesting example about the cats because you show a picture of a cat and another one and another one and another one and the child gets the idea. Or I show real cats, yes. Or real cats. And then on the, say, the 20th time, you show something that's in every respect similar to all the other cats that you've shown. And the child says it's a cat. Well, when you, when you say in all, is it a cat or not? Well, it looks like a cat. It purrs like a cat. It's... When you stroke it, its fur feels like that of a cat. Yeah. But actually, it happens It's a robot. To be, it happens to be... A robot. That actually looks... Yeah. OK, well, let's run through this, shall we? And so, so I think the child was right to say it was a cat. Oh, does anyone else think the child was right to say the robot is a cat? Really? And the, the child... Oh, I'm sorry, it was certainly right in that it was justified to say it was a cat. Was it true what the child said? It happened to be a mistake, but the child... No, no, hang on, hang on. Let's make a distinction between justified and true. Nobody is denying that the, cat would be, uh, the c child would be justified in saying this is a cat. I'd probably say it was a cat if, it, if it's really phenomenologically indistinguishable from a cat until you cut it in half, which, of course, you would never do. <laughs> um, there's a difference between being justified in saying it's a cat and say, and... I mean, actually, the child demonstrates its grasp of cat by saying it's a cat under those circumstances. It's still not true. And in exactly the same way, Oscar um, is justified. I don't think there's any problem with saying that he's justified in thinking that's water. What we're asking is not whether he's justified, but whether it's true. Well, I think it is, I think it is true. OK, but you also think that it's true of the robot cat that it's a cat, and, and I don't think many people would be, agree with that, would they? OK. Well, it, it's only if you can stand right outside that situation, if you are... But in order to determine truth, that's what you've got to do. Epistemology and metaphysics are completely different. Epistemology is to do with what we know, what we're justified in claiming, and metaphysics is to do with truth, what is actually the case. And the point of a thought experiment is to pull apart what we might be justified in saying and what we might be true in saying and why, we'd, why it would be true rather than merely justified. But surely with any, uh, anything scientific, uh, I mean, hasn't Popper effectively shown that you can't grasp absolute truth in that sense? Um, we're not doing science here, <laughs> we're doing philosophy and the, and the thing about philosophy is that it's not constrained by the laws of nature, it's constrained by the laws of logic. It's um, an experiment, it's a thought experiment. The thought, it's a thought experiment which is governed by the laws of logic, not by the laws of nature. And even if it's true that if we were in that situation, if we were Oscar, there's no way we, well, we might, it's a bit suspicious that we found ourselves in a room with a doppelganger, etc. But, but there's no way we would know that that isn't water, but it still isn't water, is it? We know because we're standing outside and that's what it is to do the thought experiment. What do you mean by water? When Oscar says that's water, what does he actually mean? Okay, well, that, that's a different question. We could say, okay, I rather assuming, and Putnam is, 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 well, he's not assuming, he argues, um, Oscar, or, sorry, the truth conditions, not the truth value, the truth condition of Oscar's water concept equals, it's true when applied to H2O and false otherwise. Now, Putnam is definitely assuming that. Um, and we might think it's a reasonable assumption because 
Oscar has grown up in, a, in an H2O world, etc. We know that science has shown that water is H2O, therefore water is necessarily H2O. That's why Putnam thinks that. But what you're suggesting is that maybe the truth conditions of Oscar's water concept are true when applied to H2O or XYZ. No, no, no I'm saying it applies. To Oscar, it doesn't apply yes. anything to do with HTML or XYZ, it's the properties of the liquid. It's a liquid that it's used to, or it you know, looks as, exactly the same way as all the other liquids are, all the other. And it does the things which he expects water to do. And that's okay. what he means. He does not mean XYZ or XYZ. Okay, um, that's a different theory about the same thing. What we're arguing about here is this question. Excuse me. Um, the question is, what are the truth and falsity conditions of Oscar's water thought? Or in other words, what is the meaning of Oscar's water concept or his water <coughs> word? Um, okay, one possibility, and this is the one Putnam argues for, he doesn't just assume, but I rather assumed it in this, is that um, water means H2O. Um, I've just suggested that maybe water means H2O or XYZ, and Bill's suggesting, I think, that water, and, and I think, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Harold. Harold. Um, okay, water means um, uh, anything satisfying the phenomenological and um, dispositional properties of the stuff that on Earth is H2O. No, but I'm saying that the stuff that is on Earth H2O, but on, X, is on Twin Earth is XYZ. In other words, this is the same as the cat that is in fact a robot, but, but is indistinguishable from a cat. No, you may have a different one, but I'm asking whether this is... What's wrong with that? I think Oscar thinks of its properties. No, no, this is us. Sorry, this is us trying to work out what the content of Oscar's thought is. It's not what Oscar thinks. Oscar thinks that... He has a water thought. Not, I'm making an argument to say that Oscar is not wrong in saying it's water. No, I know you are. It, on this one, Oscar's thought on Twin Earth would be false. And on this one and this one, Oscar's w thought on Twin Earth would be true. Do you, do you see, are you with yeah, me? I see that, but I, I just don't like the reference to, to H2O and things like that, because no part of Oscar's thought. No, but if, if Oscar's thinking... This is the thing that, that by drinking it satisfies me. It, I see it, it, it runs in rivers and you know in waterfalls. It comes out of the sky. That's what he's thinking. Because I know that as water. Yes, that, but in fact, and if, he drank, if he drank X Y Z, it would not satisfy his thirst. I don't, I don't. No, it would. No, no, you're, you're thinking because if it's not X, Y, Z... I mean, actually, orange juice isn't H2O. No, that satisfies my thirst. So why shouldn't X, Y, Z? It, 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 wouldn't, it wouldn't taste the same, or it... No, it, 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 it would only be the this same. Is actually irrelevant. <laughs> it, it would only be the same. Th this is a thought experiment, please, not an empirical experiment. We know that something that, that has a different molecular structure on Earth would have different properties. We are, we're doing a thought experiment, so we're looking at logical possibility, not empirical possibility. We know it's not empirically possible, but it is logically possible there is no logical reason well for example it doesn't it, couldn't it have been the case that as a matter of fact um the only testing on water has been done um sorry there has never been anyone testing the molecular structure of water in russia for some reason russia is probably a bad example <laughs> we find some <laughs> namibia <laughs> outer mongolia something like that and somebody, a, a bored graduate student one day thinks, I'm just going to 
guy, I've got nothing to do, ha uh ha. -huh. <laughs> I'm going to test the molecular structure of this water here. And he tests it, lo, it's X, Y, Z. Well, that's odd, he thinks, and he tastes it, and he looks at it, and, he, and then other people go out in Outer Mongolia. And it turns out that in Outer Mongolia, for some reason, the stuff that comes out of showers and in rakes and in that they drink and so on is all X, Y, Z. Now, at that point, you might start thinking, well, that's interesting. Um, water isn't H2O. It's either H2O or X, Y, Z. Um, now, if you think that that's possible, um, you might think that what we're discovering here is that both Oscar, twin Oscar and Oscar, have water concepts that say H2O or XYZ, in which case the truth values are the same. Do, are you with me? And if we go back to, to Harold's idea of, of um, and I believe that it's because I think um, Bill is getting worried about the fact that I've put H2O in here unnecessarily. Sorry, he is worrying unnecessarily, not I have put it in unnecessarily. <laughs> <laughs> um, is that as long as you've got something that actually satisfies all the operational definition of water, in other words, it looks like water does the things that water does, slakes your thirst, etc., um, then it is water if it looks like a duck, it quacks like a duck. <laughs> um, the question there was, are the twins thinking the same thought? Um, it is the question about whether they're both... Uh, their thoughts are both valid or true? No, no, no. Um, you see, that, that's another question that, forgive me, Susie, um, manifests the failure to... <laughs> sorry, it gets worse, doesn't it? Failure to grasp the distinction between truth conditions and truth value. And Susie is very far from the only person in this room who will be making that distinction, who's failing to make that distinction. What we're asking is not, are the twins' thoughts bo both true or false? We're asking, are the twins thinking the same thoughts? What we're looking at here is the individuation conditions of thoughts. What makes one thought the same thought as another thought? So if you imagine you, you don't have the concept chair unless you can look at this chair and see, OK, that's one chair and there's another and there's another. So one chair ends here and starts here and one chair ends here and starts here. If you've got the concept chair, you can individuate chairs. You know how many chairs there are. You know when one chair starts and one chair finishes. And what we're doing now is looking at our concept of belief, and in particular belief content, and we're saying, OK, what makes it true that this belief has this content and this belief has this content too? OK, uh, do we think that Oscar and twin Oscar have the same thought? In other words, two tokens of the same type. Or do they have different thoughts? So two tokens of two different types. That's what we're asking. And the reason it isn't looking at the truth of their thoughts is that we're looking at, if you remember, I made a distinction between truth conditions and truth value. So that, that's to do with truth conditions. And the truth conditions plus a content determine truth value. So I'm taking the belief, if it's a reasonable belief, that their beliefs are different truth values. I'm taking it back to say, as they're in the same context, they must have different contents. I could see I was losing you in that bit. I, I was running out of steam because I could see that you were all going there. Chris? It seems to me if we want to indulge in a thought experiment, we have to accept the rules of that thought experiment and not challenge the rules. Well, or else we won't get the result of the thought experiment out clearly. I mean, you have said the rule of this is that H2O and XYZ are different. Now, well, people seem to be arguing they're the same. And well, that no, hang on. No, no, no. I, I completely accept, and you're absolutely right, that in order to understand the thought experiment, you have to accept the rules of the thought experiment. But if the experiment turns out not the way you think it should, you can go back, just as you can in the laboratory, and say, well, that's interesting. I, I had, my theory generates this observable 
condition, but, but that observation wasn't borne out. I now see that that observation is false. Was it my theory that's wrong, or the initial conditions that I tested the theory in, or the auxiliary assumptions that I made as I... Which are, um, you're confusing a thought theory. experiment with a real experiment. No, I'm sorry. So the thought experiment and the real experiment are, are structurally exactly the same. The only difference between the two is that one is governed by the laws of nature and the other is governed by the laws of logic. But that, isn't that yes, where this thought that. experiment goes wrong? Because, in fact, right from the beginning, you called two different substances by the same name. Yes. And that's a linguistic error. Oh, is it? Tell me what this means. Back, two different things that are denoted by the same word. Why are you two? <laughs> and of course it could be a verb as well. But in this particular experiment where you're depending very much on what water means and the fact that it's applied to two different things, it's an absolutely illogical thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> No, because the whole thought experiment depends on this. And um, what, what you're... So here, I've got something... I've got a, a series of squiggles, OK? Um, we impose meaning on it, but it's ambiguous. There are lots of different meanings we could put on it. So we know that meaning is not a matter of, of the shape of, of the squiggles we make on paper, nor is it any matter of the sounds I make when I say bank. There is more to meaning than that. So because I'm using the same squiggle to identify the thoughts of Oscar and twin Oscar doesn't mean they mean the same thing. And what we're trying to do in this thought experiment is say, do they mean the same thing? That's what we're asking. So the, the fact that it's the same squiggle is very important we're, we're, because we don't want to confuse the experiment with using different squiggles, which will immediately get you thinking they're different things, and they might not be. You, you're going even further than that because you're saying that water for one twin uh, means H2O and water for the other twin means H2O. Well, that's what Putnam's saying. Yes, and so you're actually... The, the experiment will only work for Putnam by defining water in that way. Yeah. That. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Which is why the question that I asked in response to... Um, so what we're asking is, what is the meaning, if you like, or what are the conditions of truth and falsity of Oscar's water thought? And this is what Putnam believes. He thinks that water means H2O, OK, for Oscar. And... This is two other possibilities that have come up. This is the one that I wrongly thought that Bill meant, but actually lots of people would say that. If water means H2O or X, Y, Z, then both their thoughts are true, aren't they? Because if the truth conditions are the same, it's either H2O or X, Y, Z, then in the same context, this is X, Y, Z. So it does satisfy both Oscar and twi twin Oscars concept. So the thought experiment can't work if that's the meaning of water. And if this is the meaning of water, um, the experiment can't work again. Because if water means satisfies the operational definition of water, in other words, looks like water, feels like water, tastes like water, is indistinguishable um, phenomenologically, behaviorally, etc., from water, if that's what water means, then again, if X, Y, Z is all those things, and by X hypothesis it is, um, then these two thoughts have the same content, and in the same context they determine the same truth value. So Putnam's thought experiment does not work if water means either of those things. So the question to ask is, do we think that water means that, or that, or that? Now, what water means to Oscar, though? Not no, no, no. Oscar's belief about what he means are different from what Oscar means. Oh, oh, no, 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 <laughs> no let, I'm sorry. Let me... Um, let's do that little thing that we did again. Now, who can I pick this time? Colin. Um, Colin believes 
Marianne is wearing purple. Is that true? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Susie went, Bleh. <laughs> OK, you've got one sentence embedded in another sentence. OK, now, that's, he's just said that's true. And I, I take it you believe that's true as well. But could they both be false? Could that be true and that be false? Could that be true and that be false? Once again, we've got uh, the truth conditions of that that d vary completely independently of the truth conditions of the embedding sentence. Now, let's look at um, Oscar believes that is water. Oscar believes that Oscar believes that that is water. Are you with me? Okay, do you see that that's one sentence and that's another sentence? Okay, could that be true and that be false, etc.? Yes, it could. He believes it, he believes it, he believes it, he believes it. Well, because actually you have to ask that in the context of a belief, um, I mean, he might believe that he believes it's water, water is X, Y, it's 2 yeah. That doesn't mean that he does believe. We, we're asking, I, if I might, I'm asking you about our water concept, okay? Does water, uh, is, sorry, is it true that is water? Is that true oh, if and only if it's X, Y, Z? Or is it true if and only if it's either X, Y, Z or H2O? Which do you think our water concept is? Now, interestingly, you all believe that you believe um, that in that glass there's water. But I'm just pointing out to you that you have no idea what this belief that you believe you have is. That's why we're having such trouble here. Are you, are you with me? You, you all believe, don't you, that there's water in that glass, not ouzo. Actually, I don't like ouzo, but... It, might be vodka. <laughs> I believe it's water. Okay, it's uh, okay. Now you believe that, therefore, that's H two O. But what I'm asking is, why don't you think that you believe that it's H two O or X Y Z? You know what? What I'm showing you is maybe it, it, you should think of it as H two O or X Y Z. Does this, does this matter? Do you see? <laughs> Sorry, the whole thing is circular. This, this thought experiment has been keeping philosophers going for a long time and, <laughs> and you have just solved it right there and then. Patrick. Um, I think, yeah, I think if, if you reduce this argument to an if, if then yeah. argument, okay? So if you... Yeah, nearly all arguments are an if then. Yeah, but it, in, in a sense that simplify if... Um, so, so Putnam, Putnam, like most of us, so Putnam has as his premise, he privileges water as H2O. So um, if, if he privileges water as H2O, then I agree with him, actually, in the argument. But I think it's worth pointing out that that is an assumption. No? Oh, yeah, but that's what I've been pointing out for the last ten minutes. Yeah. It, it is... Putnam is assuming that water means H Y A. You know what I mean. Um, and what I put to you is that actually you believe this too. You, you don't believe that your water concept is, wa that is water is true if it's either H2 or X, Y, Z. Uh, although I did put to you with my Outer Mongolia, thank you, thought experiment, is that actually maybe you should think it's H2 or X, Y, Z. And when um, Harold came up with his cat example, I put it to you that actually, um, whether we could know it or not, if this cat that is indistinguishable, sorry, if this animal, this thing, it's not even an animal, that is indistinguishable from a cat is actually a robot, even if we couldn't know for sure, that, or even know at all, that it isn't a cat, it still isn't a cat. That's a metaphysical truth, whatever the epistemological truth of what we could or couldn't know. Because the fact is that cats are animals, they're not robots, well, 
Oh, let me think about that for a minute. The question of the rigid designators that we were looking at yesterday, that H2O is a rigid designator, and water we're a bit sort of iffy about. Um, well done. Yeah, very well done. Um, actually, it looks as if both water and H2O are rigid designators. If Putnam is right, we, we're thinking that both of them are rigid designators, but what you are doing here is questioning whether that's true. Um, so, yes, well done. That's nicely put. Rigid designation is a very useful concept because it enables us to track things through possible worlds. But of course, we can question whether our intuitions about possible worlds are true or not. And that's what we're doing in, in asking about these possibilities. David. But with this, what you're really <laughs> saying is that, is that is that H2O introducing these terms is just a sort of pseudo-scientific gloss, but it's nothing scientific about it at all. No, not in the slightest, no. I'm. Putnam would say that water means H2O to us because science has shown that water well, is H2O. Yeah, but the theoretical the term water, you talk about it, it would rule out seawater, which is a lot more than H2O. It would rule out a lot of other things. And even if it's pure water, then the essence of water is that it's ionised. So you've okay, got that can I stop you here? To determine the yeah, truth... But, but it isn't... But it's making it scientific, and then you're saying it's nothing to do with science, it's philosophy. Well, then don't introduce these scientific terms. Because you come to a, you come to a okay, let's, let's have a look at this. A question. Um, how do we determine the truth value of that is water? Okay. So um, I, I say that we've got to do two things. One is determine the meaning of that is water. And the second is to determine whether meaning is satisfied in a context. OK, um, if I say if I utter to you a sentence in Russian, OK, I'm hoping that none of you speak Russian. If, and actually, I can't utter a sentence in Russian anyway. But if I did, uh, and then I said to you, is it true, what would you say to me? No. You've no idea. Why don't you know? <laughs> but you're not talking scientifically here. You're talking about meaning. What's that got to do with the truth value of anything? Do you, do you see what I mean? You, we usually forget that you have to know the meaning of an observation statement before you can then test it. The and meaning is, is really in the usage of the word. And if the usage that's a philosophical theory that's questioned by many philosophers. And what we're questioning is how we use the word water. Do we use it only of H2O, or would we be right to use it of XYZ? The fact is that any observation statement, in order to be tested, there are two things that, that contribute to this. One is entirely the work of philosophers, what the meaning is. The other is entirely the work of scientists. Having determined the meaning, what is the truth value? So that's an empirical study, that's a logical study, and you, you absolutely can't get away from the fact you need both. So we, we assume that science has shown that water is H2O, therefore it's necessarily H2O, but that's on the assumption that the meaning of water is the stuff around here, if you see what I mean. We, we, the stuff we drink and so on, and if we go to um, Twin Earth and discover it's different, we've got to, we can ask a question. We can say, OK, are we going to change the meaning of our word water, so it's H2O or XYZ, or are we going to say that our, the word water means H2O and that XYZ is therefore not water? And that would be a decision. Science wouldn't have any um, say in that. That would be a decision, what we decide to do. And, and if we look at the history of, for example, we, we think of two different sorts of jade, um, but we look at um, where have we got a situation where we've said, actually, there is, there's, instead of two different sorts of, this stuff isn't a 
whatever at all. Um, fool's gold is a bad example there, but here's something that looks like gold, but we're, n we're not going to say it is a form of gold. We actually say it isn't gold at all. So decisions about meaning are logical decisions. They're decisions for philosophers. They're nothing to do um, with science at all. And, and so I'm talking about this, not this. Okay, I'm spinning the logical world, uh, spinning the possible worlds on this one in order to find out more about this one. Let, let's move on because um, we've got three minutes left. Um, okay, so Putnam is saying that externalism is true. Okay, here's externalism. Now, do you remember we had this before? What's changed? Something has changed. <coughs> That's right. So, um, world one is the um, externalist world. I'm sorry, they're both externalist world. Um, what we're saying is that the um, identity of your thoughts isn't determined by your intrinsic properties. Instead, it's determined by the world itself. So, if the world has cars and trees in it, then your beliefs will be beliefs about cars and trees. But if the world has evil scientists or evil demons in it, then unknown to you, your thoughts are about demons or scientists. So on this story, the Cartesian thought experiment is actually incoherent. If there were an evil demon, we wouldn't have thoughts about chairs, students, philosophers, etc. Because if they don't exist, we couldn't have thoughts about chairs, philosophers, etc. So externalism um, is a very different way of individuating content. The content is actually determined by the world. If you like, the world comes right into the mind but the mind also reaches right out to the world. And the mind isn't located in here at all. So if externalism is true, mental states have contents that are not inside the head. They're not determined by states intrinsic to the subject, but rather by the subject's relational states, in particular relations to things in the environment. Uh, that's one argument for externalism. Here's another. This will get your thoughts going as well. This is Donald Davidson. Um, Davidson imagines that a cosmic ray hits him. Sorry, logical possibility coming up here. Uh, well, I suppose it's an empirical possibility too, but the rest of it's logical. Okay, it reduces him to ashes um, by, and you see I'm a bit uncomfortable about this, <laughs> by coincidence, another cosmic ray creates a physical replica of him a nanosecond later, or maybe simultaneously, that was even more fun, simultaneously. And the question that we've got to ask is, are the thoughts of the swamp man, um, he's in a swamp, incidentally, when the cosmic ray hits him, sorry, I left that out. Um, are the thoughts of the swamp man the same as thoughts of Davidson? So here we are. <laughs> um, that's Davidson. And the swamp man is a physical, phenomenological and behavioural replica of Davidson. Okay, ex hypothesi. Uh, exactly the same as Davidson. And the question is, um, are his thoughts the same? Whoops, let me ask you that question. I hope you didn't have time to read that. Do you think the swamp man, is the swamp man able to think fondly of Davidson's wife in exactly the same way Davidson does? So Davidson has fond thoughts, we would hope, well, he's dead now, but he, he did have fond thoughts of his wife. Would the, th the swamp man's thoughts, would A, would he have thoughts of Davidson's wife? B, would those thoughts be the same as Davidson's? Is it assumed that it's neurological? Yep, setup? he's physically, phenomenologically, and behaviorally identical to Dave. I, I mean, I realise the picture... <laughs> suggests otherwise, but as he comes out of the swamp, he, he's, his suit comes together and all the other... So that's, so if you say yes, you're internalist. If you say yes, you're an internalist, exactly, because an internalist believes that the content of your thoughts 
is a function of your physical, phenomenological, and uh, behavioural dispositions. If you're an internalist. It's interesting. He hasn't, uh, Swampman hasn't got a wife, has he? Because it was Davidson who sat there at the altar and exchanged the vows with his wife, whereas Swamp Man didn't even exist at that point. Harold. Well, it isn't, ex hypothesi. Well, in that ah. case, how could, you, how could he be identical? I mean, we're assuming he's identical. He clearly can't S- be thought identical. experiment, yeah. logical possibility. We, we are assuming for the sake of the thought experiment that the cosmic ray has created something that's physically identical. Phenom- I mean, sorry, you have to go into logical possibility here. You can't... Those of you who don't accept this thought experiment, fine. We'll carry on with the other people who do. We've got, we've got a whole session of questions afterwards. Um, OK, you're quite right, Patrick. If you're an internalist, you have to say yes. Because if thoughts are determined entirely by your intrinsic states, then the swamp man must have the same thoughts as Davidson, because ex hypothesi, um, he is identical to Davidson intrinsically. Um, But the questions I ask is, would the Swamp Man be able to have thoughts about Davidson's children that David himself has, bearing in mind that Swamp Man has never met Davidson's children? So it would seem to the Swamp Man, firstly, that he is Davidson, secondly, that the children that he thinks about as his, he believes are his, but we know they're not because he wasn't their father, Um, end of story. Um, would the Swamp Man be able to have thoughts about David's past actions? Now, the Swamp Man believes he does, so he believes he remembers the, that his first swimming trunks were green and that when his mother gave it to them, him, she also threw him in the swimming pool and let him get on with it. Um, swamp Man believes that because he has all the... It is with him exactly as if it is with... Uh, sorry, as, as if he is Davidson... Um, but, of course, actually, can you remember P if you didn't experience P? Usually we would think not. Um, it's a necessary condition of remembering P that you have actually experienced P. Um, false memory is very badly named. I'll come to you in a second. Um, OK, if you, if you think that Swamp Man doesn't have the thoughts of Davidson, then, again, you might prefer to reject internalism and take up externalism. Um, okay. Descartes in terms, but he wouldn't say yes, would he? Uh, he would have to. But he, I mean, he would see his soul in there, so it isn't just the physical properties oh. of the person. <laughs> <laughs> um, Descartes was actually much more interested in phenomenological properties than physical properties. Um, so if you've got the, it, if it is with the Swamp Man, exactly as it is with Davidson. So ev- everything appears to him exactly as it would appear to Davidson. For Descartes, that would be enough for it to be the case that his beliefs are the same as Davidson's beliefs. And we're much more interested in physical states, which is why, and, and also behavioural dispositions, so we put that in just to make sure that we've got all the internalists in the same bag. Um, OK, let's, let's move on. I, I know there are other questions, but we've got plenty of time. So to embrace externalism is to embrace the idea that mental states are the sort of states we get into rather than the sort of states that get inside us. See the difference? I've got a picture here. Pink. Um, externalism are mental states of the sort we get into. So your mental state is, if you like... Um, not just you and what's inside your head, but also inside what's inside your world. So the pink down there, your thought about a car, you wouldn't have a thought about a car unless the cars exist. Okay, that, that's externalism. Internalism, 
says that your mental states are the states they are just because of your intrinsic properties. What's out here is completely irrelevant. Okay, this could be this, or it could be a... Um, thank you, the demon. Um, or, or anything, or, or it could be just nothing. In fact, I shouldn't have put these two in, um, because I, what I should have put there is, is nothing. Um, so mental states are the sort of states that get into us, according to externalism, see the pink here, and for externalism, mental states are the sort of states we get into. So I couldn't have a belief about Janet unless Janet existed, according to the externalist. Um, according to the internalist, my thought about Janet is, is a property of mine, quite independently of whether Janet exists or not. Okay. Um, if mental states are the sort of states we get into, rather than the sort of states that get into us, then all our attempts to construct an account of the relation between the mental and physical states have been based on a false premise. Um, we've been assuming that mental states are the sort of states that get inside us. We've not been thinking of them as the sort of states we get into, which is a whole different ball game. Identity theory argued that mental states were states of the brain, Functionalism argued that mental states are states that play a certain sort of functional role, and the physicalist functionalist, if you remember, says that all such functional roles are played by states of the brain. And anomalous monism argued that all causally efficacious mental states have physical description, and the way we looked at it, we implied that all such physical descriptions would be descriptions of brain states. So, each of the theories we looked at assumed that a mental state is the sort of state that gets inside us, not the sort of state that we get into. Um, interestingly, though, and this is where it really does get interesting, embracing externalism doesn't mean that functionalism or anonymous monism are necessarily wrong. Uh, certainly, identity theory is wrong, but we already knew that anyway because of Kripke's argument. Both functionalism and anomalous modernism can be modified to embrace externalism. Um, so the only one of the theories we've examined that can't be modified is identity theory, which, as I said, we knew was wrong anyway. Uh, so functionalism would merely have to widen functional roles to, to include roles that go beyond the brain and the body, and anomalous modernism would merely have to widen physical descriptions uh, to include relational descriptions. Um, but if externalism is true, it seems clear that no matter how much neuroscience can tell us about the brain, there's a limit to what it can tell us about the mind. Um, I mean, obviously, it can tell us things about the mind. It can tell us which states realise mental states, etc. Um, but if, even if the mind is physical on this story, mental states are not neural states. They're not states of the brain. References for you, um, and where to go from here. But we'll look at that when we come back from the break, because we're, we're a bit late. So come back at 20 past, would you? And we'll have the question and answer session.